As we move along in the CCNA Voice video course, talking about Voice over IP fundamentals, it's time to introduce the concept of digital signal processing and DSP modules. Uh, I'll be your instructor, and um, you know I think you're uh, starting to understand my style by now. So we'll just jump right into this. We're going to talk about DSPs, how they're used, and we're going to do a demonstration of the Cisco DSP calculator. So the modules that you see on the screen here are DSPs, Digital Signal Processors. So what is a DSP and, and what do I need it for? Well, it's a hardware device whose primary role is to convert analog signals into digital signals to do that sampling that we talked about you know, back with Nyquist theorem. Uh, provide compression and encoding functions. So these DSPs are the A to D, D to A converters, essentially, uh, that are in your router, taking care of turning that voice into packets. Uh, they're installed into a router that is being used as a voice gateway and they take the processing load required uh, for doing those conversions off of the CPU and they do it in hardware. The module you see here is a network module. This is a NM-HDV. This is actually one of the first modules I was ever, uh, ever used. It's a high density voice network module that you could put DSPs on. You'll see four of them there populated in it. And it had a voice wick slot, and you could slide a interface card, and that's probably from the look of it a a VWIC 2MFT T1, which would give you dual T1 interfaces. But uh, you know, I kind of digress here. I'm going off on a tangent. Um, there are different sizes of DSP modules that Cisco has in the PVDM2 series. Some of the modules you'll run into is the PVDM2-8, 16, 32, 48, and 64. And what's different about these modules is the number of actual digital signal processor chips that are on the module. And uh, the PVDM216 is what I would recommend for a study lab. It gives you plenty of capacity to, to do a few phone calls but not go overboard. And others are available. P the PVDM3 is out now. You know They can do a lot more, uh, both quantity and capabilities. But again, check your hardware for what's supported in your equipment. What will work in a 2811 may not work in a 2911. So, fair warning. Um, DSP modules can be installed either on the main board of your router or they can be installed in a network module such as this NMHDV. And um, how do I figure out how many DSPs do I need? So DSP calculations. This is kind of a loaded question. Some of these calculations are really, really easy. Others can get to be quite interesting. So when you're trying to plan for DSP resources, don't just plan off the top of your head. Um, go to cisco.com and use the DSP calculator. In fact, I'm going to jump out of the presentation right now to show you the DSP calculator and um, give you an idea of what all is involved in doing this calculation process. Here's the Cisco DSP calculator from the Cisco website. And I'm going to go in and I'm going to do a really, really simple example here. I'm going to tell it I've got a 2801 running 15.12t. I'm going to tell it that I have a VIC 2, 2 FXO. So I have two voice channels. It's a two-port analog module. And I want to actually outline something here for you. In various iterations of Cisco's training and, and lots of the old print material, Cisco referred to voice codecs as either medium complexity or high complexity. Well, things have changed recently, and Cisco has started referring to G711, Cisco Fax Pass-Through, Cisco Modem Pass-Through, and Clear Channel as low-complexity codecs. So make sure when you're in the calculator that you understand that G711 is now considered a low-complexity codec. So I'm going to tell it I want two audio streams, you know, basically full capacity of this two-port FXO, and I'll hit next, and I'll leave the rest of this blank because I'm not going to do anything else with it. And it's going to tell me what I require. It says you need a PVDM2-8, and you need one of them. It tells me that there is an allocation of two DSPs, or two DSP channels, I should say, for voice, and there are six available. So six plus two equals eight. So now you know how they're sized. If I wanted to do this for a PRI, let's say it's a 2811, and we've got a VWIC 2MFT T1. That is a two-port PRI module. I'm going to tell it that I want to do 46, whoops, 46 channels 
of audio because remember a PRI has 23 channels so times 2 equals 46 and we'll hit next next and it tells me I need 46 for voice and I have two available and it, it put me in a PVDM 2-48 now if I were to use a more um, uh, not more a higher complexity codec like G729 check this out this is really interesting to see what happens so we're going to use that same card we just did that VWIC2 MFT T1 and let's see 48 voice channels are the maximum supported we'll say give me f whoops 48 channels I gotta click in the right box here f ah, come on 48 there we go sometimes this mouse gets a little crazy so 48 channels in the medium complexity tab and we'll hit next and it tells me down here, medium complexity codecs, G729A, AB, G722, and T38 fax relay. We'll say next. So now, it tells me I require 96. So I need a PVDM-264 and a PVDM-232. That's a lot of resources for, if you remember, all I was trying to do was 48 calls. So I'm using a lot more DSPs uh, to do the legwork and the heavy lifting and let me run that lower bitrate codec. Understanding codec complexity. This is something that we just touched on when doing the DSP demonstration of the DSP calculator. And I showed you how Cisco has different classifications for codecs and it's based on complexity. And really it's, it's about how much work does the module, how much work does the DSP have to do to use this codec. So obviously things that are more compressed are going to take more work and things that you know you just sample and go are going to be lower complexities. So I show you here for the scope of your certification and I want you to understand that this is something that's been changing recently and you saw evidence of that in the DSP calculator but traditionally Cisco has considered G711, G726, G729A and 729AB as medium complexity codecs. You noticed that in your DSP calculator, however, G711 was now, you know, in this, you know, 2013, a low complexity codec, at least for the, sc the scope of that tool. So don't get confused here. It used to be that it was just medium and high, and now there is a low. High complexity codecs, G728, 723, plain old 729 without an A or a B. Um and then uh, G729B, I should say, and then ILBC. So whenever I say 729, I'm in a bad habit of referring to 729A and, and uh, just calling it 729, but there is a difference. So if you hear me you know, generalizing G729, I'm usually talking about A. And I show you here, keep in mind, Cisco now has a category of low complexity. You know, So when you're reading your exam questions, keep in mind, is it asking me, if G711, for example, is low or medium, if it's asking if it's low or medium, obviously it's low. If it's asking me if it's medium or high, well, it's medium. It just depends on, you know, are you asking for the old definition or the new definition? And Hopefully they won't trip you up on the exams with that kind of trivial stuff. But, uh, you know, G721, or I'm sorry, 729 takes a lot more heavy lifting. Um, for you know, like 729B or ILBC or, you know, those other variants, Whereas, you know, straight up native G711 is a little bit easier, a little more lightweight, obviously, because you're not compressing anything. You're just sampling and packetizing it. And again, a reminder, the DSP calculator now treats G711 as a low complexity codec. RTP and RTCP. The Real-Time Transport Protocol, or RTP, operates at the OSI session layer. Now, RTP rides on top of UDP, which is at the transport layer of the OSI model. And the purpose of RTP, yeah, I mean, it's really not the purpose, the function of RTP is this is where your audio is at. Um, RTP is going to be how your audio, your voice over IP audio content, traverses your network. So it's, it's UDP um, you know, as RTP. RTP is going to add timestamps and sequence numbers so that if you have packets getting out of order, you can reorder them uh, upon delivery. You know, we do that in what's called a de-jitter buffer. And we also um, manage playback speeds, you know, by looking at the timestamps. Obviously, if we lose some data, we'd much uh, rather 
have, you know, a brief, you know, millisecond of silence where there may have been a spoken syllable uh, as opposed to it showing up later. You know, it uh, it wouldn't make sense to put words out of order. <laughs> kind of defeats the purpose of voice. Um, again, you know, this is why we use UDP. But uh, RTCP, the RTP control protocol, um, we use this for performance reporting, and it's going to provide metrics on the RTP stream. So things like packet count, things like delay, packet loss, and jitter. And if you haven't heard the term jitter before, jitter is going to be variations in delay. So, uh, you know, that's where RTP and RTCP come into play. That wraps up this video session. Um, I thank you for tuning in. And uh, as we continue forward, you know, we're, we're really starting to get into the nuances of the IP-based transport and the voice over IP. And, uh, you know, having a lot of fun doing it. And hopefully this has, uh, you know, been interesting to this point. I promise, um, you know, the the most fun stuff, uh, it, actually we're getting ready to jump into it any time now, is, um, you know, yet to come. And, you know, we're going to be doing some labs. We're going to be doing some hands-on demonstrations of some of the applications involved. And uh, we'll start uh, taking a lot of this theory and, and putting some practical application to it. So for now, I'm going to say see you later. And I look forward to speaking with you again in the next video series. Thanks, guys. Good studying.